Good morning. I'm hoping that everyone had a really blessed Christmas together. Uh, There's still many traveling, and we want to continue to pray for them. I did want to mention uh, two weeks from today, the bulletin says it's next week, but actually two weeks from today, Beverly and I will begin a class for younger people, younger adults uh, in the glass room, and it's going to be on marriage, but really also on relationships. And uh, so I want to encourage all of those of you who would consider yourself to be younger adults. Uh, I know that's somewhat relative, but to, to come join us there. That's two weeks today, from today, though, okay, on January 13th. Uh, I regularly, in recent years, hear evangelical leaders talking about America as if it's on, as if it's destined for doom and destruction, Uh, this imminent catastrophe that's awaiting us. And and it seems to be just part of uh, something that's within our culture today, this general sense of anxiety that so many of us feel. People have lost their faith in government. People feel overwhelmed, which has led one psychiatrist to refer to the climate in our country as a psychological pandemic of fear. And what should God's people have to say about that? Well, my personal personality trait is not geared towards seeing the glass half full. And I'm just confessing that to you. Uh, And it's hard to be optimistic when your retirement nest egg has been ravaged by the current market. And there's some of us who live with this threat of terrorism that just absolutely paralyzes us in fear. But being people of faith, which implies that we are people who trust in God, it either means what it implies or it's a lie. I'm going to repeat that because I expect some amens about that. If we are going to say we're people of faith, which means we put our trust in God, then it either means we put our trust in God or it's a lie. So. This climate that we're in, our uncertain times, Marilyn Ferguson describes it like this, and and, and I like this description. She says, it's not so much that we're afraid of change or so in love with the old ways, but it's, it's that place in between that we fear. It's like being between trapezes, okay? You can imagine an acrobat as they're going from one trapeze to another and they're in between. She says, that's kind of what it feels like for many of us. It's Linus when his blanket's in the dryer, she says. There's there's nothing to hold on to. And without a crystal ball to be able to predict what's going to happen in 2019, it then leaves us with the question, how should we as believers live? And let me offer one word that ought to trump all others when it comes to the way we live next year. And it is the word hope. We of all people should be living in hope. Hope is the trump card. Now, I bet we can all identify with putting our hopes in something. Longing and waiting, hoping anticipating, only to end up disappointed, to end up let down. And that happens because most of the time we misplace our hope. You've done it, right? I've done it and I do it. There are things, there are people There are situations, there are governments, there are ideologies and systems, there are presidents that we place our hope in. 
that ultimately disappoint us. And it reminds me of a character in the novel, in the novel and movie, Lonesome Dove. Lonesome Dove's the story of these two retired Texas Rangers. One of them's played by Tommy Lee Jones, and his name is Woodrow F. Call. And Robert Duvall plays the other one. His name is Augustus Gus McRae. And in one scene, these two guys are talking about another character in the movie that was also a retired Texas Ranger, but he's taken the wrong path with his life, and his name is Jake Spoon. And so Gus says, Jake has always been too leaky of a vessel for anyone to put much hope in. And then he adds, but then all vessels leak to some degree. And that's so true when it comes to where we put our hope. I want you to think about that when it comes to where you place your hopes. Where, where you think everything's going to work out a certain way and, and it's, uh, it's going to just fill us up and it's going to satisfy that aching in our souls, that longing within us. But then the reality is that anything in this broken world, anything this side of heaven is a leaking vessel and it cannot hold our hope. So, if everything leaks, then what can hold our hope? Hope. It's a word that's such a part of our everyday language, and we use it in a way that really kind of waters it down. I hope it rains today, or I hope it doesn't rain today, or I hope I can lose the weight that I gained over the holidays. You know, we use the word hope all the time. But the way that the word hope is used in Scripture means a confident expectation. And not only that, it's a confident expectation that has a contagious enthusiasm for what is to come. So, let me take you to a verse that, is, that was dear to my daughter. In fact, Part of this verse is on her tombstone. And so it's become an anchor for Beverly and me in our faith wall. These words from Paul are a benediction of sorts as it comes toward the end of his letter to the Romans. It's his prayer for them. It's his hope for the church in Rome. And this is what he says. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him, that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And honestly, I just want us to look at ourselves, just pretend there's a mirror in front of you, and I want you to look into that mirror and ask yourself, how well am I living into these words? Now, unfortunately, we tend to be kinder to ourselves when it comes to things like this than is reality. So maybe another question I would like to pose it this way. Uh, how would my family, how would my spouse, how would my friends say that I'm being filled with all joy and peace as I trust in Him? How would they say or would they say, would they say these verses describe me, that I'm overflowing with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit? Well, let's break this verse down for a few moments. He begins by saying, may the God of hope, and if we left here right now and went home, praise God for that. Praise God that He is a God of hope. And this tells me that God is both the source, but He's also the supplier of hope. Paul's declaring something about the very essence, the very nature of God. We say God is love, and certainly He is, but God is also hope. He's not just the inspirer of hope, 
He is the author of hope. He doesn't just dole hope out to us either. He is hope. And because of that, hope is not based on possibilities. Hope is based upon promises. Promises like what Paul says in chapter 8. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Promises like we are forgiven, we are cleansed, we are made new. Promises like someday we're going to receive a new body, a resurrected body. It will happen. And it is not based upon possibilities. It is based upon the promises of God. And so may the God of hope do something. And what is that? May the God of hope fill you so that we are overflowing. May He fill us with what? Joy and peace. Paul talks a lot about joy. Joy is not just an outward expression of happiness. Joy is more about an inner satisfaction in the soul. He's not talking about someone that just happens to have a bubbly, outgoing personality that always has a smile on their faces. Joy is not about just a cheerful disposition. It's about this inner satisfaction in our soul. And Paul couples joy with what? Peace. Peace. An inner settling of the soul. So so you have this inner satisfaction of the soul and this inner settling of the soul. There is rest and contentment an ease of soul that comes through the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Charles Spurgeon, the old, uh, old-time old preacher from the 18th century, put it this way, and this is a little bit in Old English, but I still love it. He says, peace is resting joy. Joy is dancing peace. Joy cries Hosanna before the well-beloved. He's talking about God. Joy cries Hosanna before God, but peace leans her head on his bosom. Joy and peace. And so I'm saying that in part to say this. Don't excuse a lack of peace and joy in your life to to saying, well, it's just not my personality. It's not a part of my makeup. Because brothers and sisters, the joy and peace that Paul's talking about here is not to come from you. It comes from the Holy Spirit who is living in you. And he transcends all personality type. Paul's praying that you and I will be filled with the evidence of the Spirit's work in our lives. And that includes being people who are settled who are at peace in our souls. And then Paul says, as you trust in Him. These things come to those of us who are placing our trust not in governments, not in presidents, not in money, but are placing our trust in Him. The one who redeems, the one who reconciles. At the end of Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 12, Paul tells us that at one time, we were all without hope and without God. But then in his letter to the Romans in chapter 5 and verse 8, he tells us that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And the promise of Romans 15, 13 is for those of us who have placed our trust and placed our confidence in Jesus Christ, the one who has done these things for us. 
And then Paul says, so that. So that. This is a turning point in this prayer for us. Paul's now going to give us the why behind the what. At the end of verse 13, he says, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul's benediction, I want you to notice, verse 13, is bookended with the word hope. May the God of hope cause you to overflow with hope. The good news about the God of hope is that he has an abundant supply. He's not going to run out. Is there anyone in here who does not need more hope today? Anybody? We all need more hope. And the good news is that God has that hope for us. It's not rationed out. It is a hope that he lavishes upon us. And as our hope grows in us, as our hope wells up in us, he just pours more hope on us. And so Paul prayed this prayer for Christians in the church in Rome in the first century. But it's a prayer that I want to pray for us as a church in 2019. I'm hoping perhaps... I haven't even talked to our elders about this, but I'm hoping maybe for an extended period of time when they close us in prayer that they will just pray Romans 15, 13 over us as well. That this can become a prayer for us as a church. And I want to give you a couple of practical suggestions for attaining this kind of hope that he's talking about here. The first thing that I want to suggest, and I do this every year about this time, It's just an important reminder, and I'm afraid too many people turn a deaf ear to this. But if you want the kind of hope Paul's talking about, you've got to increase your time in Scripture. Because Scripture is one of the tools that the Holy Spirit uses to reveal to us this God of hope. Scripture helps to clear our perspective. It causes the fog to be taken out of our vision. The second thing I would suggest to you is be honest in identifying misplaced hopes in your life. Remember, all vessels that are broken leak. And the only kind of vessels on this earth are going to be broken vessels. So, Name your leaky vessels. Name those things that you are putting your hope in. Be honest about it. Write it down. Tell your spouse. Tell your close friends. Share it next week in life group. What are these broken vessels that I tend to put my hope in? Now, for anyone who's here today and is not in Christ, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to receive this gift that God is offering you. It's the gift of eternal life. It's the gift of hope. But eternal life does not just mean someday in the great by and by. Eternal life begins at the moment that you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. Jesus said in John chapter 10 and verse 10, I have come that they may have life. That's present tense. It begins now that we may have life, and what kind of life? Abundant life. Don't fall from the line of the health and wealth gospel, folks. It'll tell you that abundant life means Jesus is promising you riches and all kinds of health and blessings. That's not what it's about. The abundant life is a life of hope and joy and peace. Listen to these words from Paul that are found earlier in his letter to the Romans, chapter 5 and verse 1. He says, therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. 
Not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that sufferings produce perseverance, perseverance character, and character hope. And hope does not put us to shame. Some translations say hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to you. Hope does not disappoint. I want you to think about that. Think about things that you have hoped in. Think about those leaky vessels that you have placed your hope in and how they've disappointed you. And Paul is saying here, no. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Real hope, true hope, hope that is sourced in God and hopes that the hope that is supplied by God will not disappoint you. That's right. And that's an astounding statement, isn't it? And so, on this next to last day of 2018, and no... Russ, I didn't prepare this a year ago, so I really do mean (laughs) next to last day. As we're heading into 2019, we don't know what it holds. We don't know if our circumstances are going to be better by the end of next year or if they'll be worse. My guess is that in a group of this size that some of us are going to end the next year with things worse than they are. Some of us are going to end the next year with things better, but for most of us, it's going to be a mixture of both. But brothers and sisters, even though my personality type is not this, I refuse, I refuse to be a pessimist. I refuse. And I refuse to be a pessimist who only sees darkness and gloom in our future for two reasons. At least two reasons. The first reason is, it is a sure sign that your eyes are fixed on broken vessels. If you are a pessimist about the future, it's because your eyes are fixed on the wrong, in the wrong place. But the second reason is, it kills our witness for Jesus Christ. People are not drawn to negative pessimism. And that's not what God offers us anyway. Everything He offers us is about hope. It's optimistic message. And hope tells us that with God, we can be confident. And so for 2019, as we look to the source of all hope, And the one who supplies it in overflowing abundance. I want this to be the prayer of our church. I want this to be your prayer individually, but I want this to be the prayer of our church. And so what I'm going to ask us to do now, let me first say, we're going to remain standing and we're going to have an invitation song for anybody who might have a prayer need that they want to come share or who wants to go to room 102 to meet with an elder and his wife or maybe, hopefully, someone here today who wants to come be joined to Jesus in baptism. But before we do that, I want to ask you to stand with me. And I have put this verse up here, but I have changed it a little bit to make the pronouns first person singular. And I just want us to read Romans 15, 13 together. May the God of hope fill me with all joy and peace as I trust in Him, so that I may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing.